Good evening. Hi. Um, this, uh, uh, thanks for joining us uh, for the first uh, webinar uh, that we're hosting today as orthopedic uh, specialists. Uh, my name is Ragbir Kaka, and um, I'll, be joined, I'll be joined by my uh, co-panelists, uh, Mr. Ali Nurani, uh, Professor Adrian Wilson, uh, Dr. Christian Clay, and Dr. Ronald Van Heerwarden. Um, uh, once again, thank, thanks for coming along. I'll just share my screen. So this is, as I said, this is the first one that we're hosting tonight. So we're hoping to do, we will be doing um, a webinar every fortnight and we'll be co covering a whole host of topics, um, starting off with um, our first one today, which is an update in uh, knee joint preservation. Um, in two weeks time, Mr. Ali Nurani um, and Professor Van Reet will be looking at updates in shoulder and elbow joint preservation. We'll be covering um, ankle instability and heel pain with Mr. Neem Hadari and Mr. Thomas Hester. Um, following that, we'll go on to young adult hip pathology with uh, Mr. Tony Andrade and Mr. Tom Pollard. Both of these um, gentlemen are um, at the frontiers of uh, hip preservation surgery. Uh, Mr. Luke Cascarini might be a name you're familiar with. He's a, a well-known maxillofacial surgeon based in central London, and he's gonna be going through managing jaw pain. And finally, we'll, we'll wrap up the series with a talk um, by Professor Aaron Ranganathan, uh, looking at all things related to back pain and, uh, back pain and related disorders. Uh, tonight we've been lucky to have uh, been awarded um, uh, CPD uh, points for the um, two CPD points by the Royal College of Surgeons. So I would ask at the end of the presentation you'll be emailed a, question, a short questionnaire. If you could kindly email that back to us we'll send out a certificate uh, with the two CPD points. Uh, we will take questions in between the talks um, and uh, as well as having a panel discussion at the end. Uh, please feel free to put the questions uh, throughout the chat while we're uh, giving the talks and um, I, will, I will go through them. I'm now gonna hand over to Mr. Ali Nurani, who's the Medical Director for Orthopedic Specialists and Harley Street Specialist Hospital. Ali, thanks. Hi, can you all hear me? Um, so I'm going to just um, share my screen and talk about just for a few minutes about um, our orthopedic specialist groups. So, um, so this, this group was formed, um, um, the idea is very uh, old, about 10, 12 years old, uh, but recently um, quite a few of us have come together with similar minded ideas on how we want to deliver orthopedics. Um, Currently, there are 17 of us and the group is growing. We are based in London, but as you will see, there are plenty of us that uh, uh, work not only in London, but other parts of UK, as well as other countries in Europe. Um, I know that uh, Adrian might touch upon some of them as well. So I'm gonna just show you some of the slides on who we are currently. Um, and this is the, the last slides we have um, for people who have joined. But quite recently, quite a few of uh, um, some upcoming stars have joined, including Tom Hester, Tom Crompton, and, and some of our hip guys that you'll be hearing about in a few weeks' time as well. Now, we, we are, as we said, we're based in London. Um, most of our work is done in two of the hospitals, and, and we are actually very, very grateful for them giving us uh, support. Uh, both clinically as well as you know helping us run these webinars. Um, so I want to do a special thanks to uh, the Harley Street Specialist Hospital based in the Harley Street area as well as the London Clinic um, and we tend to do uh, the majority of our orthopedic surgery um, in these two hospitals. So that's all I have to say for today so welcome to the uh, our first webinar hope uh, you enjoy it and I will now pass you back on to uh, uh, Ragbir to um, introduce other hosts. Great, thank you. Thanks, Ali. Uh, so uh, without further, uh, further ado, we're going to uh, kick off with um, Professor Adrian Wilson, um, who's going to be talking to us about the assessment and uh, management of uh, uh, knee ligaments. Uh, he's just going to introduce the, the group as well. Thanks. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks a lot, Rags. I'm just uh, trying to get the technology here going to share screen. Going to my desktop, uh, open system preferences. Keep talking, Rags, I'll try and get my screen going. 
Great. Like, so go, go go with your presentation just so I can see if I can I can sort this out. Okay, guys. So I, I'm going to be talking today about um, knee. Um, uh, we're going to be talking about knee injuries. So I'll just get my presentation up. Sorry, Adrian. Um, okay, there we go. Brilliant. Okay, here we go. So, actually, so um, my talk is going to be about the non operative management of arthritic knee pain and common knee injuries. Um, as Ali kindly introduced me earlier, my name is Ragbir Kakar. I'm a consultant trauma and specialist knee surgeon and uh, the, we're going to cover a few things today so the aim of the talk is just to go through osteo is to go through osteoarthritis how big a problem it is we want to talk about how it's currently being managed and given the current climate um, we would need to talk about uh, covid and how we're currently managing the situation we're going to go through the alternative options that are currently available and then we're going to go on to talk about a couple of uh, common knee injuries that you may see in your practice and something that uh, most people would want to know about uh, what needs urgent uh, attention. So um, a bit about myself, I'm a consultant trauma and orthopedic surgeon. I'm uh, based at Guys and St. Thomas's Hospital in my day-to-day -day NHS practice. Um, I'm um, one of the um, members of the orthopedic specialist team. My sub specialist interest is in knee osteoarthritis and sports injuries. And together with my fellow uh, panelists, I have a real passion for joint preservation and you'll see that a lot of the topics that we're talking about today revolve around this area. This is the view from my trauma room, I'm quite proud of where I work. And even on a uh, cloudy day, you get a brilliant view. And on a nice day like today, uh, this is what Tommy's, this is where I work. So uh, let's right, jump into I, I don't think we can see your presentation, at least I can't. Okay. We don't have um, your screen, Ragby. Oh, my apologies. Yeah. Can you see it now, guys? Yeah, we can see it then. Yeah, there yeah. we are. There Perfect. we are. Brilliant, brilliant. Sorry, guys. Um, so we're going to go into osteoarthritis first. So this is um, a huge problem within the, within the UK. It's certainly the greatest cause of years uh, live with disability throughout the United Kingdom. And this is uh, seen throughout um, across Europe. In the UK itself, it affects over 17 million people with 30 million working days lost per year. It's the third highest spending in the NHS at £4.7 billion. So it's a real significant burden on our uh, health service with 20% lower employment rate compared to the healthy equivalent. And as you can imagine, a lot of these patients who are unable to do their work um, have to retire much sooner with up to a quarter of that working population. It affects the UK equally. So we know that up to 29% of the population within England and the rest of the UK, uh, uh, other countries that make up the United Kingdom, it's a very similar prevalence and it affects the female population uh, greater than the male population. We know that the, with regards to the age groups, it certainly affects the older age group and that's very well known. But this slide also demonstrates that there's significant amount of younger patients who are also affected by osteoarthritis. We also know, but don't completely understand why uh, it, it tends to affect those from a more deprived population. So what is the end point with osteoarthritis? Well, if you go to the extreme, it is joint replacement. And as this data demonstrates, over 106,000 joint replacements are performed um, each year. And these are figures for 2018, with, um, as we mentioned earlier, affecting um, predominantly uh, the female population and the average age tends to be somewhere between 67 to 70. The diagnosis tends more often than not to be osteoarthritis, with some patients um, having uh, similar issues due to rheumatoid arthritis and some secondary to hip fractures. So, but the vast majority are due to osteoarthritis. And it is, as it is well known, uh, the average BMI is, uh, as a patient is considered to be overweight. It's a very similar scenario with uh, knee arthritis. 
um, with more joint replacements performed compared to the hip, hip replacements. And the vast majority of these patients suffer with um, osteoarthritis, and the BMI in this group tends to be um, in the obese range. So what's the current situation with COVID? Well, as we all know, there's a reduced access to healthcare professionals. Uh, certainly in my hospital, we, we haven't, um, we've ceased doing operating lists, and it's unlikely that these operating lists will be uh, started up again for another uh, two to three months. There's a greater waiting uh, time, and given that we, a lot of the people are currently in lockdown, getting exercise has proven difficult. So this is perhaps the most important slide in, our, in my talk. Um, what we're trying to do is keep people um, in this traffic light system in the green. So we're aiming for repair surgery, we're aiming to look at regenerative and pharmaco pharmacology, as well as uh, braces, insoles, and physiotherapies, uh, physiotherapy. These are all things that we're gonna to touch upon uh, throughout our talks, but I'm largely gonna focus on the pharmacology and the orthopedics. So what's the current guidelines given for non-surgical management of knee arthritis? Well, we know that, um, that we're gonna talk about the intra-articular use of steroid injections and uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Starting off with corticosteroids, these have been used uh, for many years now, and their aim is to reduce inflammation within the knee joint. They work by re uh, work, uh, reducing in inflammation of the synovium, which is the main pain generator within the knee when it comes to osteoarthritis. Um, some of you will have come across the different preparations, including depomedrone, hydrocortisone, and even those that are combined with hydroxyapatite. But so what is the advice with corticosteroids in the current climate? Well, we know there's some systemic absorption, even if you inject it into the knee joint. And the Royal College of Anesthetics have suggested that it should be used with caution, if at all. And we know that, that there is a link with severe viral lung injury in the past. So in essence, what we're saying is this is, there's no hard evidence um, against it. But given our past experience, we would recommend um, it's being used with severe caution. Now, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs is well documented to have effects on respiratory symptoms. Um, so those of you who are treated to patients who suffer with asthma know that a significant cohort of your patients will not be able to uh, use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And currently, there's no evidence to suggest that a non-steroidal drug can increase the risk of requiring COVID-19. Whilst the evidence has been collected, the advice has been to you carry on using paracetamol for now. And those who are using non-steroidal drugs for arthritis should not stop taking them. However, if you're about to start somebody uh, on medication with newly diagnosed arthritis, it should currently be avoided. So whenever we consider any therapies, it's really important to look at the evidence for the efficacy. So in, in this situation, we refer to ORSI, the Osteoarthritis Research Society International. And they looked at 60 interventions in osteoarthritis and categorized them based on the published evidence. So if we consider level 1A evidence, the, the best evidence is for land-based exercise program, i.e. physiotherapy. So we work very closely with our physiotherapy colleagues to manage all of our patients, whether they're being managed non-operatively or due to go on uh, operative intervention, um, uh, to make sure that they're get the best possible outcomes either with non-operative management or prepare them for surgery. The other um, good option, which has level evidence 1A, is topical steroids. So we know a lot of patients who are taking Voltrol creams will always say how well they do from taking them. So these have got level, high level of evidence. Looking at the next uh, level of evidence down, we're looking at pool-based therapies. We know that hydrotherapy pools work very well in patients who've got reduced, reduced range of movement, reduced mobility. Um, in that same category, you can consider oral non-steroidal drugs and, and then finally intra-articular hyaluronic acid. Interestingly, there's no steroid um, uh, in this level of evidence as the evidence for steroid working for a prolonged period of time is relatively poor. So let's talk about hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid works to mimic substances with found within the knee joint. It works as a lubricant or a shock absorber, and there are many types of uh, formulations, either as a single shot, multiple shots, or combined with steroid. Um, Orsi recommend, uh, based on the uh, data provided by Orsi, suggests that pain relief can be sustained beyond 12 weeks, 
and has a more favorable long-term safety profile compared to steroid. And as I mentioned earlier, there are lots of different preparations. We're gonna now move on to bracing. Now bracing is uh, commonly used in patients who have got unicompartmental arthritis. And the way it works is to offload the diseased uh, part of the joint. It is shown to reduce pain and improve the function. And it can certainly buy time prior to undergoing any procedure. And a lot of our patients will enjoy a good level of activity. The ideal patient, as I mentioned, is somebody who has unicompartmental arthritis. That is to say they have arthritis either in the medial compartment or in the lateral compartment, and they are either bow-legged or knock-kneed. We know that the benefits are that it can improve the function and thereby hopefully avoid any operative intervention. But in the same breath, you, it can also be useful to mimic a procedure you may be considering. Um, Dr. Christian Clay is going to be going through osteotomy surgery. And this is something that I, I may use in a patient who wants to know what it may feel like having a more permanent solution like an osteotomy or a partial knee replacement. This is a good diagram demonstrating how uh, one of the popular braces work. You can see that circled area with um, inflamed uh, bone osteoarthritis and the brace simply offloads it by applying a three point pressure and taking this varus knee into a neutral one, thereby relieving the pressure on the inside of the knee. And in my experience, these work very well. We're gonna move on to foot orthoses. This is not something commonly orthopedic surgeons may, may look into, but if we have a holistic approach to managing patients with knee arthritis, um, there's really good evidence to suggest that if we alter the foot biomechanics and take the adduction moment arm into an abduction moment arm, you can offload the medial compartment in various OA and vice versa in those who, are, who have got that um, valgus disease. I would, however, say this works best in those who have got early to moderate OA it's not so effective in advanced arthritis. And we know certainly there's provision for uh, custom-made orthoses, providing you get um, proper gait um, analysis. I'm now gonna talk about knee injury and uh, common um, presentations that you may see in your practice. With acute knee injuries, this, the common uh, scenario still work extremely well. So rest, ice, compress, elevate, the principles of rice, and there are certainly new devices available which combine uh, icing and compression uh, to help reduce such symptoms. This is a, an example of a device that um, uh, we commonly use in our practice in uh, post-operative phase. We know that it significantly reduces the amount of pain relief patients will take um, uh, after, after surgery. And similarly, you will often see athletes on the um, edges of pitches who've had um, injuries may use this to help reduce the swelling and um, control the inflammation. So at what stage do you need to get urgent medical uh, attention? Well, we've had guidance from the Royal College of Surgeons and the most critical conditions are when you have an open fracture, so that is a fracture of a bone with the open, overlying skin open, painful hot swollen joints and dislocated joints. So a septic joint is one that is infected and this may be a replaced joint or a native joint. The typical presentation is that it's hot, swollen, and painful. The patient may have a fever, and they may also have constitutional symptoms of feeling sweaty and unwell. The management would be to take fluid off the joint, see, and this would be done by an orthopedic surgeon, and may require urgent surgical intervention to relieve that infection. And this can be a life-saving life procedure. Similarly, injuries that involve the extensor mechanism, so injuries around the patella tendon or patella dislocation or a locked knee. So we've, we have um, the extensor mechanism would be when a patient's unable to lift the leg from the ground. They may have um, a patella fracture or dislocation, and this may involve the patella tendon or the quadriceps. A surgery is required in this circumstance to restore the normal function of the knee. Now, lock knee is commonly spoken about, and uh, this is quite an important thing to, to, to know about. Typically, it's a twisting injury, which results in um, um, the inability to straighten or bend a knee. And there may be several reasons why this may occur. For a one of those occasions would be a meniscal tear. As we mentioned, it's typically a twisting um, injury. The joint is painful and swollen. 
they were unable to completely straighten the knee, and this is second, usually due to a meniscus tear causing a blockage. Our management is clinical examination or always, and this is supplemented with an MRI scan. And depending on what this shows, if this confirms that there is indeed a meniscus tear, we would want to perform urgent surgery to unlock the knee, uh, whereby we repair the meniscus or take the meniscus, uh, perform a partial meniscectomy. Now, our aim as joint preservation surgeons is to repair the meniscus where we can because of vital structure in protecting the normal cartilage. In cases where a patient has got an arthritic knee, then we know the evidence points to uh, physiotherapy and rehabilitation working extremely well in that situation. And um, that's, that's more of an indication for non-operative management. In certain instances where the meniscus is torn in degenerative disease, and is causing irritation of the medial collateral ligament, this can be a very satisfying procedure to relieve that pressure. So there are certain instances where um, a bit of cartilage has come loose uh, from the surface of the, of the patella or the femur. This is either with a patella dislocation or in patients who've got pre-existing osteochondritis uh, dissecans. The presentation is very similar. The knee is locked, it may give way uh, with pain and swelling. And once again, we identify the exact cause based on the history, examination, MRI scan, and then potentially the, the need for surgery. We perform the surgery using keyhole um, um, methods uh, to evaluate the displaced fragment. If it's not repairable, then we have to excise it. And then we've got other options to try and replace that area of missing cartilage. However, if it is repairable and that is favorable, will use dart or screw fixation as demonstrated on these slides. In the top left, you can see the uh, cartilage surface has come away from the femur. And this, this is an arthroscopic probe showing the, the bone underneath and the nice pearly white cartilage surface. We can prepare the surface and put wires in to hold it in position. And then we finally fix it with screws. And here's just a um, cartoon illustration of how it should look. So in summary, and uh, as I finish my talk, we're going to, we, we discussed that osteoarthritis as being a chronic and debilitating problem. Injuries still remain um, prevalent despite the current um, COVID crisis and may require urgent um, attention. As we've gone through my talk, um, it's, uh, I've said it's really important to have a holistic approach and work as an MDT uh, with, with your colleagues. And there are lots of options available other than surgery. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, these are just uh, details um, should you wish to get into contact uh, with me. As I mentioned, I work at Guys and St Thomas's, and these are the private institutions I work at. Uh, thank you for listening, um, and I'll take any questions. Thank you, Rags. Rags, the, um, there will be some questions coming through, hopefully, while uh, Adrian sets up. Adrian, you're up next, is that correct? You may have to unmute yourself, buddy. Got it. Perfect. Yeah, ho ho let me try and screen share, then we can ask some questions just whilst I'm messing around. Um, so while Adrian's doing that, are, are there any questions from the attendees? So, so Rags, in, term, in terms of you start off with a non-operative um, management with injections, hyaluronic acid, steroid, and so on, what about PRP? I mean, do you think that now the evidence is, is in favour of, of us as that being a go-to for an acutely inflamed knee? Or do you think we should start on the old traditional um, escalator of steroid hyaluronic acid and then think about the more you know, uh, newer ways of treating a knee problem such as PRP? Yeah, so that's a really good question, Adrian. PRP has been really topical and has been on the forefront um, with certainly with um, tendon inflammation. So we've you know, if we speak to our upper limb surgeons, they've been using it uh, frequently for uh, lateral epicondylitis. And certainly around the patella tendon, um, I've seen it being used a lot. The evidence for um, its use in osteoarthritis, there's lots of good review papers demonstrating an early um, to, sort of, to moderate arthritis that it has a role to play. Um, we're still awaiting nice guidance um, as to its routine use um, in, in, um, in, in our day-to-day -day practice. So what I would say is I think we need to do more research on it. And I know that that's something that um, the, the team is involved with. Um, I do think that it does have a role to play in early um, arthritis. 
and I think it's a question of watching the space where uh, where we can where we can use it. Um, Raj, we have two quick questions: uh, one through yep. chat and um, and one through a Q and A thing. Um, in fact, um, there are a few more coming through now as people yes. are getting some encouragement. Um, so Nima Dari has put a question in: Should we be injecting knees with steroids if patients are in pain? Uh, in particular, I guess we're thinking about osteoarthritis with the, with the current evidence uh, uh, for steroids and against steroids. What's your summary on that one? Yeah, so so my, my summary is that the, at the moment, certainly with uh, COVID-19 going on at the moment, we should, we should be avoiding uh, injecting um, uh, steroids. And it's well, it's well documented. A lot of the uh, governing uh, bodies, uh, BASC, BOA, have advised against this use. But in more normal times, it's really effective. You know, it works very well. Um, be that for the short term, um, it, it does work well. And we have lots of patients that often aren't suitable for operative intervention and are, we're, we're simply trying to maintain a reduction of their pain symptoms. So we, we know that, uh, that we, can, we can use it to help reduce pain, but we also know that, you know, in the younger age group, I totally avoid, uh, try, try and avoid using it. Um, because of its link with um, damage to healthy cartilage and potentially requiring um, arthroplasty in the future. So hopefully that answers your question, the kind of patients I would and wouldn't do it in. And just one last question, something like meniscal repair, is that available on the NHS as well? Uh, is it available at uh, guys, for example, where you work? I mean, would you be able to offer that to the selective patient uh, if, if they turned up the right time frame and so on? Yeah, so uh, in my routine practice where I can, um, I, I will. I use um, uh, meniscal repair. It's in um, the kitchen, let's your mum. Uh, that's that's my go to uh, go to method of um, uh, dealing with meniscus tears. Fantastic, and, it, well, and it's no different with NHS or, or private. Good. So I've got some other questions relating to that. I'll answer the panelists uh, now, but as uh, the, the attendees. But um, if you can introduce Adrian in the meantime, yeah, we'll carry so, on. How are you getting on there, Adrian? Yeah, good. I'm all set. I'm all set. Sorry, I've been fiddling great, with my great. mic. So it, gives, it gives me great pleasure to um, introduce Professor Adrian Wilson. Um, Adrian is a dear friend and colleague of mine. We're, we're partners in um, all the things that we do related to uh, orthopedics. And, and he's my um, fellowship trainer. I did all of my orthopedic uh, knee training under his uh, tutelage. And he's going to be talking to us about um, knee uh, ligament injury. Uh, over to you, Adrian. Brilliant. Uh, thanks a lot, Rags, and thanks for the kind introduction. So, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about us again, about uh, and and focus my talk on ligament injury. So, um, Ali's already uh, mentioned that myself, Ali, and Nima set up uh, the OS group. Rags came in right at the beginning, and now we've got some amazing superstars working with us. With uh, Duncan Whitwell in Oxford, who's heading up our sarcoma. Aaron Ranganathan leading on spine. Um, and we've just uh, had Tom Pollard and uh, and uh, and um, uh, and the, the Reading Hip Unit uh, Tony and um, Tony Andra joining us. Sorry, just sort of forgetting where I am. And I'd like to introduce also the the superstar. So the first one I'm introducing is Christian Clay. will be speaking. Christian and I messing around here in the lab, doing some uh, doing some work together on the knee. We do a lot of innovation together. Uh, in the field of uh, osteotomy surgery. He's a, literally a genius surgeon, and we've, been, we've asked him to come and join us because he really does offer things that other surgeons can't, can't um, offer. He is such a good surgeon that when I'm here, I am looking very sad and forlorn in December with my sore hip, and uh, Christian went on to actually perform a hip replacement, and he said, look, I think you're gonna do quite well. I think you'll be up and about quite quickly, and, uh, and he had me actually running around to the point where here I am uh, without my wheelchair, uh, about to get on the aeroplane uh, four days down the line, uh, uh, looking a bit fuller in the face actually, uh, and uh, walking pretty well at three days after my hip replacement. So I'm very grateful to him for that as well. Um, Ronald's another very dear friend, and again, uh, can offer things to the group that just don't exist in the United Kingdom. He got me into osteotomy. Uh, he is a, he's an absolutely amazing teacher, great researcher, brilliant surgeon and uh, uh, we're just so excited to have him working within the group he's made uh, a lot of monthly visits now they've become more and more the norm before covid came in and we've got a lot of very happy patients that we wouldn't otherwise have been able to treat 
He's also very partial to tea, and, and that's another reason why he likes coming to the United Kingdom. So um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the key ligaments now in this talk, uh, the ones you're familiar with. Uh, I mentioned a little bit about the lateral side. I'll, I'll touch very briefly on the MPFL, and we must always include the extensor mechanism when we're thinking about uh, uh, the medial lateral, anterior and posterior aspects of the knee. So managing the acute knee, um, Rag has already mentioned that we need to think about cryotherapy, particularly in, in this current climate where it can be very difficult for patients to get uh, uh, interventions. Um, and, and the question then is with an acute knee, uh, as physios and GPs, many of whom have tuned in, uh, what do we do? Do we gently get the knee going or is that going to damage the knee? Can, can we get our patients to wait there? Uh, is it safe or is there damage inside the knee that will be detrimental with weight bearing? Should the patients be using crutches? Um, should we indeed put them into a brace? Um, and whatever you're doing, I think in the background, you need to think about cryotherapy. These patients with an acute knee injury all need an MRI and they need a clinical assessment so that we can tell uh, our colleagues, GPs, physios, and each other and the patients, of course, exactly what's going on inside the knee. So a little bit about the ACL. This is a picture from Charlie Brown. It's a beautiful dissection showing the two bundles, the uh, AN, the key bundle tight in flexion, the PL tight in extension. It's roughly 25 millimeters in length. Um, here we can see some uh, MRI scans. This is the normal MRI scan showing here clearly the black sigma of a normal uh, ACL. Uh, all we need to see is a break in that. Here, this is quite a significant tear but any break in this uh, is indicative of, a, of an ACL rupture and obviously MRI is very sensitive at picking that up and we can assess it in all three planes. Uh, here's some more, again, Charlie Brown pictures actually showing the two bundles again and the ridges where we would be planning our surgery and here the hurtle ridge showing where we like to go. And over here, we've got a video of a slightly lax ACL and a child just showing the structure um, uh, as it moves from the tibia onto the femur. So what is the history? And I'm sure everyone listening uh, will be familiar that uh, usually it's non-contact, football for the boys, netball for the girls in, in the United Kingdom. Skiing is very good for the knee surgeons because it's a great source of ligament injuries for us. Um, it's usually actually non-contact. Uh, the patient will change direction, twist, uh, possibly hear a pop, the knee will give way and they'll develop sudden swelling and, and, and severe pain. Now, when you hear that, I twisted, I, I felt something go, often they get their knuckles and they do this um, and, they, and they describe an in-out sensation. That is 100% a rupture of an ACL and, and those patients need to be assessed. So of course, we always show the gratuitous video of the, uh, of the poor individual. Who, this, this is a patient of mine, a young, um, a young athlete, gymnast, uh, and you'll see as she comes into um, her backflip, how she twists and injures the knee. And these people will present to you and of course they'll present in pain and, and, and with the swelling, the classic history, they need assessment. So sorry, I'm just gonna. So how do we assess the knee? So this is the three tests that we have are the Lachman, which I'm performing here, showing uh, sorry, the anti uh, the Lachman. Uh, again, if you're if you're slightly slight, you can position over your own knee and carry out the same uh, maneuver. Uh, we have the anterior draw and we have the pivot shift. So let's look at a few more examples. This is a little five-year-old. I had to treat positive anterior draw, positive Lachman. And then as we put the knee into valgus and we apply uh, a valgus force, uh, uh, we can see from extension to flexion, we see the flipping of the pivot shift as we take the knee out and back into joint again because of the ACL being ruptured. Uh, here we see a massive pivot, pivot shift. And often when we see these really big pivot shifts, these patients have got an additional injury and we need to consider uh, treating their antilateral ligament, um, uh, which is something we can discuss. Now, the, the thing that we're really worried about uh, when, when we see our patients is, um, will this patient cope? Will this patient not cope? Are they gonna damage the joint surface or are they gonna damage the menisci if we do nothing? Uh, and this is something I'm gonna discuss further. This is a normal appearance of, of, of a joint. If we look now at some damage, this is typical. Uh, this patient's um, sadly been giving way a lot damage the meniscus badly and we can see excoriation and damage to the um, to the joint surface. So 60% of patients who rupture their ACL have meniscal tears, many of which we can actually repair, and 16 to 47%, 50% will have severe chondral injuries. Now the mean time to surgery, to treatment for this, uh, and I'll, I'll make the argument for, for that we should inactive people treat these aggressively, is 12 months in the United Kingdom, which is, uh, which is pretty bad. 
in Australia, Japan, and the US, it would be six weeks. And beyond that, it's actually termed chronic. Um, so what we're worried about is uh, secondary damage, mispathology, and actually more and more for the physios, the GPs, and the surgeons, the medical legal implications of not treating these patients appropriately, um, and the secondary damage, arthritis, and issues that can happen if we don't treat them uh, aggressive enough. Here, a very sad tale. Uh, this is a 26-year-old. He's been treated non-operatively. He's had painless giving way, which is often, often the case. They can often do a party trick. See the ruptured ACL here in the notch. And then we come over, and that actually is the good side of his knee. As we come over into the lateral side of his knee, we can see a torn lateral meniscus and really horrible damage to his lateral femoral condyle. And of course, this is arthritis. In a 26-year-old, this is devastating. So um, these patients, uh, we've in a, I've been leading actually in innovation in several of the techniques. I'm very, very uh, happy to have been part of the all inside story. Uh, here we can see a, an animation coming up. Also helped to pioneer with the antiretroviral ligament uh, repair, which I'm going to talk about a little bit, and my concept of ligament reinforcement. So here on the animation, we can see an external device coming in and making a socket. So we've made a pilot hole through we flip the tail of this helicopter type drill we can then take it out through the pilot hole we can do exactly the same on the tibia come in introduce a second socket as opposed to a tunnel and there are many advantages to this all inside acl procedure which is uh, was very new and we were pioneering it 10 years ago and now is is the preferred technique uh, for its number one technique in the us for um, acl surgery still slow to take off in the uk but it's slowly getting there and here we see the button going up we see it loading onto the side of the femur, and then we draw the ACL into the socket uh, and down into the second socket using a second button. So this is all inside because the ligament is fed through the arthroscopic portal and not up through a tibial tunnel. So it's two sockets, and this is a very good way of performing the surgery. So I was very lucky to be part of the ACL repair story with my uh, good friends, uh, Greg De Felice and, and uh, Gordon Mackay. Uh, and we've really pushed ligament repair around the globe. Greg from the US, Gordon up in Scotland, and myself pushing for uh, the advantages of ACL repair. So what is this? This is a re direct repair of the ligament. This allows early mobilization. Um, uh, we, we know that fiber tape is, is safe, uh, and this is minimally invasive. And the most important thing, particularly for children, where it seems to work extremely well, is, pa is patients can get back to sport in four months after repair here. We see this very young knee with an a, a internal brace beside the repairs, uh, which we've taken up to reattach the ACL. But this young girl got back to a very high level of activity quickly. And this is a game changer, particularly for children who um, have psychological issues when they're told they're off to sport for a year. We've, uh, we've published, uh, in, in particularly in, in the paediatric world, I'm very grateful to John Davis, I think he's listening, for publishing out two year results, which are really extremely good in children for this uh, technique. Now, this needs to happen within six weeks. So we need an early referral for this if we're going to have a chance to uh, repair the ACL. We can sometimes do it beyond that, but we really like to get these early. So let's move on to the PCL. So the PCL is a much broader, bigger, uh, larger ligament, two bundles again, uh, anterolateral postromedial. It attaches obviously from the femur at the front to the tibia at the back. And we can grade the translation that we can uh, demonstrate on patients from one to four. We keep it nice and simple. Uh, this can be uh, uh, done uh, on a stress x-ray or it can be done uh, with a, a mechanical device but often we just actually grade these patients manually by uh, how much the posterior drawn uh, takes the tibia back uh, zero to five is grade one grade two is up to 10 millimeters grade three beyond 11 millimeters grade four there's always additional uh, ligamentous damage so here we see the normal black signal of the pcl on these two mri scans healthy and here we can see a knee dislocation where we don't really see anything of the ruptured PCL. And again, we're relying on the MRI scan to tell us about this and all the other issues that are going on inside, with, inside the knee. Sorry, that's not me, obviously. Uh, this is uh, from Philip Schottel. Uh, this is a nice video demonstration of the posterior uh, draw. Uh, the etiology, uh, this is a less common ligament injury, 5% of all ligament injuries. And treatment does remain controversial, particularly for the isolated PCL. Um, clinical results are getting better and better with surgery, but the vast majority of patients we can treat conservatively. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. We can treat conservatively. Here we see an animation from Medi showing the posterior rupture. 
uh, of the PCL as the tibia goes back. And the most common injury mechanism is a dashboard injury um, or falling onto a flex knee. And these are the other mechanisms which can occur. So here, my old mentor, Peter Myers in Australia, is back in 2005, a very nice demonstration of grossly uh, unstable PCL showing the posterior jaw nicely at 90 degrees, which is how we carry out this uh, examination. So um, in terms of imaging, we've, so we've, we've, we've talked about this, but we can also do fancy things like this, stress x-rays, where we can actually measure much more accurately how much the tibia goes back on the femur. And this gives us a very, very nice uh, way of, of being more scientific about the classification. Now, for the acute injury, we like to get them into a a swelling brace straight in this PTS brace from Medi. Um, uh, the patient remains in this for two weeks. There's a bump in it to, to drive the tibia forward. And then we will start to mobilize the patient. In the more significant injuries, greater than 12 millimeters, we would think about an acute surgical procedure, but almost always this is associated with other ligamentous injuries. So isolated PCL ruptures, we try a, a brace, uh, acute combined PCL rupture, and, and we always use a dynamic brace for post-operative reconstruction. So let's talk a little bit about that. So again, here we see some stress x-rays, we see the posterior draw, and here we've got the brace from Medi. All of the companies uh, have these dynamic braces. We can see on the left-hand x-ray um, how the bars are not lining up, and then we can dial the, uh, the Medi brace. Let me just get rid of the volume. We can dial the Medi brace, and the Medi brace allows us by turning this knob to actually reduce the tibia um, by pushing the, the uh, tibia forward. And these are highly effective, but they need to be treated early. So you need to get your hands on these patients within the first few weeks after the injury, such that you can reduce the posterior subluxation and manage the patients in, this, in these brace, which they need to live in effectively uh, for aggressively for six weeks and also for three months. Here, a patient of mine, you can see me uh, uh, turning the, uh, the dial on the back of the brace, driving the tibia forward. And these are very comfortable and very well tolerated, these braces. And I think a game changer. Now, surgical management is important. And sadly, historically, the outcome of PCL reconstruction has not been good. If you could get half the laxity that you started with, this was considered to be a good result. But with the all-inside technique, which again, I, I, I performed the first all-inside PCL globally uh, back in 2013, um, and pioneered this technique. Um, actually, we've shown some really nice results. We've moved away from the large screws and the big tunnels to these very elegant sockets uh, with these buttons that you can see on the right-hand x-ray. And if we look at um, my good friend, uh, Bruce Le Levy, uh, who works at the Mayo Clinic, has published 32 patients with a minimum of two-year follow-up. And the side-to-side -side difference using the all inside technique, 1.1 millimeters is a game-changing uh, procedure using the all inside technique. So, yeah, surgery does now work. Whoops. Oh. Sorry, I was trying to, to deafen you all. And this shows how the drill comes up, hits the target, and stops us, if we look to the right, from having this, which is what all orthopedic surgeons are terrified of, which is a vascular injury and damaging the popliteal artery. Uh, here's an interesting case, actually, I did with rags uh, many years ago. I saw this patient this week, which made me think of him. He was uh, nine when he first came to me. We operated on him when he was 11. He had this knee dislocation. We went on to, we went on to write it up uh, because it's so unusual. You can see the horrible laxity. He actually had a lateral injury as well, but we just treated his PCL. Um, and again, we see the, just to make sure that I'm not going to deafen you, we see the drill, how it comes up and hits the target. In this case, we actually had to sort of make things up because none of the guides fitted. We went below the growth plate on the tibia and above the growth plate on, oops, on the femur. And I'm delighted that he's doing so well, uh, deafening with your headphones in. Let's move on to the MCL. So the MCL is composed of two bundles, superficial MCL, which is the, the main workhorse, uh, and the posterior oblique ligament, uh, which sits behind. And we see it here on this uh, image, which I've stolen from the internet. So, um, of course, we have to show you gratuitous uh, videos again. So here, in extension, not too bad, but at 30, we can see a lot of movement sucking on the medial side. We can stabilize the knee. And we can see how this knee is opening uh, on the medial side. So if we, if we just now talk about the classification, grade one is a clinical or MRI diagnosis because the patients are stable in both flexion and extension. And we treat these, of course, uh, conservatively, maybe a brace if the patient's in a lot of discomfort, but usually we just get them going. 
grade two is stable in extension, but opens uh, at 30 degrees to a degree, but there's an end point. These can be treated conservatively, but these patients need to get into a brace aggressively within the first few weeks if it's a significant MCL injury, otherwise they're gonna heal long because we need to brace them in slight flexion for the first few weeks. Grade three opens in both extension and flexion, there's, or there's no end point in flexion. And here we need to start thinking about uh, surgical intervention, uh, particularly if there's another ligament involved. They do heal well in braces if they're isolated, but if there's any other ligamentous injury, we would now advocate treating that quite aggressively with an internal brace, which I'll talk about in a minute. So what about imaging for the MCL? Here we can see a normal MCL, it's a nice thin band coming down the side here. This is a, a normal uh, MCL on this MRI scan. If we look at the, uh, at the other pictures here, we can see the MCL completely off. Uh, and in fact, this case here, which is the one that we're seeing to the right, the MCL is actually sitting inside the knee. Uh, and these cases we do need to treat surgically. So forgive me for the uh, gratuitous, um, pictures I'm about to show you. In the uh, internal brace situation, we lay a fiber tape with two anchors um, over the correct isometric points through tiny stab incisions. And this has been shown uh, both scientifically and clinically to work extremely well as a, uh, as a, as a way of managing this. Um, here, we're checking the isometry, making sure that we're loose in flexion and tight in extension. Obviously, the, the, the fiber tape actually goes internally. This is a, a preliminary check before we commit. Uh, and here we can see a, another case. Again, we go back to the one that I showed you where this is the actual uh, uh, ligament. This is uh, one of my registrars. He was on call actually, walking around with a, with a limp. And I said, what have you done? Uh, uh, and um, he, we went on to, to scan him. He had this, um, we did a reconstruction. Here you can see me finally finishing off with the staple. And it looks like a dog's dinner, but he actually uh, got back to um, playing competitive rugby within sort of six months. He's very well. What about the lateral side? So the grade one and grade two injuries, similar grading system to the MCL, we brace, but the high grades we, we repair if we can. Uh, we do a reconstruction. Uh, uh, sorry, we do an internal brace. Um, if it's a significant injury or chronic injury, we would of course do a reconstruction. So again, I'm just going to make sure I don't deafen you. There we go. Um, here we can see in extension, uh, he's moving, and he'll, so he's a grade three in extension, and uh, if we flexed him, he would move even more. So that's assessing the lateral ligament. We assess them at straight and we assess them at 30. Here again, the MRI is crucial to show us what else is going on inside the knee, and we can uh, see this is completely off the fibula head, this, this uh, LCL. And in the chronic situation, or in the ones where we do need to uh, treat them, we can now treat them with reinforced grafts through very small incisions, as you can see here uh, in my minimally invasive technique that I've written up, which is also quite a popular way of doing this. You can see me taking up my graft, which is reinforced with fiber tape, and we're reattaching that into the femur. Here, this is what we were doing a lot of, big open dissections. This is a case where the comparineal nerve was also involved, and we've now moved to this nice minimally invasive technique. So what about the MPFL? So this is a, um, let me just kill that. This is an MRI scan. It's here we can see the patella, we can see the femur, and we can see the VMO, and the MPFL attaches from the side of the patella down onto the femur. Here it is here, um, uh, and it is actually ruptured in this case. Um, and we can, of course, go on to reconstruct this. If we just sh show you the effects of that, here we can see the patella is off and a very easy dislocatable in this valgus knee. And this is the structure that's been torn. Um, and actually, we now have a very nice technique that we can do through small incisions where we can make sockets uh, and we can plumb in uh, an allograft or a hamstring tendon uh, into the side of the femur, uh, sorry, side of the patella, take it through the appropriate layer and fix it into the femur. And this is the way in which we carry out our MPFL surgery. Uh, we don't treat these uh, uh, surgically with the first dislocation. We tend to uh, manage these conservatively initially, and it's only for, usually for, for patients that have recurrent dislocations that we go on and treat them in this way, as most of them will actually settle. Uh, Ronald's gonna talk a little bit about how we sometimes might be addressing the wrong problem when we see these patients, as often this is associated with a malalignment issue. And in fact, the most important thing is to correct the malalignment, which is one of the things that Ronald's now brought to the UK, uh, and we've treated many cases successfully since he started. So um, in summary, uh, for the ACL, 
we do recommend surgery in active individuals. 20% will cope, they won't have any giving way, but 80% don't cope, have ongoing instability, and they get secondary damage. And there is now a significant number of medical legal issues that we're having to deal with as surgeons for patients that, we, that we've allowed to go on and develop those secondary problems. The PCL, the vast majority, can be managed conservatively. We need an early MRI. We need to brace them dynamically to get them to heal to the right length. The high grade, uh, we or the failed conservative treatment, or the multi-ligament patient, we would operate on. MCL, the vast majority, can be treated in a brace. Again, an early MRI scan and an assessment. But bracing and physiotherapy is the way to go with cryotherapy. Same for the lateral side, but we treat the high grade injuries, the grade threes, with surgery or when it's part of a multi-ligament problem. So for the acute knee injury, uh, we would always go down the route of, uh, of resting the patient with cryotherapy, giving them anti-inflammatories, go for that early referral so we can see what's going on. If there's an ACL tear, perhaps we can repair it. Is there secondary damage? What do we need to do to this knee? Um, and uh, we're there for you if you would like us to treat your patients. Thank you very much for your time and, and I'll take some questions. I hope I didn't overrun too much, Rags. No, that's, that's brilliant, um, Adrian. I've, I've been answering a few questions to go along, but it'd be great if you could uh, just to take a couple of those So while Ron, Ronald gets his uh, screen up. So sure. Adam, Adam asked a, a really important question. He said, with the delay in the surgeries um, currently because of COVID, how do you think this is going to affect long-term management and outcomes? Well, I think at the moment we're treating people in a very... Um, sort of if you like old-fashioned way and uh, we know in the old in the old-fashioned ways of treating patients many of them did okay with conservative management uh, but many of them didn't so I think there's going to be issues now one of the things that's happened is COVID has put people inside they're not skiing they're not playing football they might be going out doing straight line activities like jogging but we haven't seen team sports uh, we haven't seen pivoting activities. So I think that the, the amount of secondary damage is, is less. But, but, you know, the classic tale for the ACL is I was playing football. I changed direction. No one touched me. My knee gave way. I had immediate swelling uh, and pain. I couldn't play on. I went to, see the, went to, to the local a and &E. I was assessed. They took some x-rays, which didn't show any broken bones, which, of course, they very rarely do. And they told me to go and see my GP if there was a problem. I went to see my GP because I went to see my GP who, who felt the same. Um, I gave it three months and then actually I felt fine and I went back to playing sport and on my first game of football my knee gave way again and in fact it was worse than the first time uh, and now I'm, I'm, I'm here to see you as a result of that. So I think there are going to be a lot of people who may be lulled into a full sense of security uh, because their knee doesn't feel too bad because they haven't tried it out yet. So I think what we need to do with these patients is be very careful. They need to do a return to sport uh, assessment by our physiotherapy colleagues and be properly assessed by the physiotherapists and have uh, imaging before they engage in any uh, pivoting sport. That'd be my take. Thanks, on. Adrian. There's lots of questions, and um, I promise to get, get to them at the end. And I appreciate there's a lot of technical questions as well, and I promise we'll, we'll get through, through those. But we're going we're gonna to next hand over to Dr. Ronald Van Heerwarden. Now, it's a real honour and privilege to have uh, Ronald as part of the team. He's, he's a real educator, travels around the world, um, not so much uh, currently, uh, given the situation, but otherwise he's very well known amongst uh, knee surgeons for uh, osteotomy uh, surgery and joint preservation. So I'm not going to take up any more of his time. Uh, thank you, Ronald. Over to you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Rex, for the introduction. And thank you all for viewing this webinar. Uh, it's a privilege and an honor from the Netherlands to present this on behalf of uh, OS and uh, I work together there with a, a very nice and experienced team as I also work together with such teams in the Netherlands and Abu Dhabi and other centers all around the world. I hope uh, my first slide is up now. Is that, it is. Is that okay? It, yeah, okay. it's perfect, Ronald. Thank so you. I'm going to talk about uh, what maybe seems a difficult topic, anterior knee pain. We all are familiar with that. But what has miserable malalignment? and I'm going to explain what that is to do with anterior knee pain. So let's move on and let's have a look at this young lady um, walking. She has a dramatic history. She has been walking like this since she was 12 years old and she has visited three orthopedic surgeons of which the last one five years ago told her it's all between the ears 
nothing wrong there in the leg. And that was because he made an x-ray and he saw a fully straight leg as I saw a fully straight leg when I made the x-ray, when she visited me uh, now two years ago. So she came in walking with crutches and walking like this. And she was referred to because of a valgus deformity. When you look at it closely, look at where the knee moves. She has a severe, what we call kneeing in. And that points us to a rotational deformity. Now, this is on anterior knee pain and miserable malalignment. What on earth is miserable malalignment? Have a look at this young lady. Look at where her kneecaps are going and look where her feet are going when she walks. She has severe kneeing in with some valgus movement. And this causes a very unstable walking pattern. Now she's asked to put her knees, kneecaps forward. Look where her feet are going. These are foot positions like Charlie Chaplin, extreme external torsion of the tibia. This is putting the feet forward and you have extreme kneeing in of femoral deformity and tibial deformity. So miserable malalignment deformity is kneeing in and towing out caused by a femoral internal rotation deformity and a tibial external rotation deformity. Let's go back to why these deformities cause anterior knee pain. Look at this illustration. If you inwardly twist the femur, the patella wants to go out. If you externally twist the tibia, the patella wants to go out laterally also. This causes traction forces on the medial patellofemoral ligament, the medial capsular structures, and this causes high pressures in the patellofemoral joint. Now, this is the patellofemoral joint. Normally, there is a balanced compression, medial as well as lateral. Now, here we go. When we inwardly rotate the femur, you get tension increase on the medial capsular structures and the patella wants to move outwards. And you get hyperpressure on that lateral part of the patellofemoral joint. So this is an explanation why a rotation position of the femur and the tibia or the femur or the tibia cause high pressures in the patellofemoral joint. The patella wants to track neutrally. Then it's stable and it has a balanced compression of the retropatellar cartilage in the patellofemoral joint. And rotational deformities, whether femur or tibia or combined, cause pain because of an uneven compression. This has all been described in, de in, in essence in detail in this publication. Now, there's different terminology for rotational deformities, and you may be familiar with it or not. Version is a normal rotation in a bone. Torsion is going to an abnormal rotation in a bone. Kneeing in, kneeing out, that's what you see in these patients when they walk. Towing in, towing out, all the same. Then there are terms like coxa antetorta and retrotorta, which is a femoral uh, rotational deformity, rotational malalignment, exotorsion of the tibia, and the miserable malalignment or torsion malalignment syndrome. Anterior knee pain, a lot of different terms. Patella alta, patella baja, hyperpression, lateral traction, hyperlexity, trochlear dysplasia, and go on and go on. Now, what do you make of this in the combination of looking at your patients? First of all, how does a femoral deformity cause a kneeing in? You have to look at the hip. This is a antiverted hip, so the antiversion is 
too high. I would call it an anti-torsion in this uh, situation. Look at the angle the hip makes with the acetabulum. Now the hip joint wants to move and you want to walk forward. When you want to walk forward, the hip finds a 20 degrees antiverted position. And it can only do that by rotating the knee and the foot inwards. So because the hip joint wants to function normally, it demands a kneeing in and towing in when it rotates into the neutral position for walking and standing with your hip. So that is why an anti-torsion of the femur causes kneeing in and towing in. The pathology associated with rotational deformity often goes unnoticed. So these patients have more complaints, but the most prominent complaints are patellofemoral pain and instability. They may have gait abnormalities, ankle complaints, fatigue during walking, these very vague symptoms. Also groin pain and hip instability symptoms may be caused by rotational deformities. Now look at this young lady. And I for sure cannot do these kind of gymnastics, I can assure you that. But what is the cause of that she produces this and she comes with anterior knee pain? When you look at how you examine such a patient, it gives you a clue what the cause of her abnormality is. This is what we call the rotational profile from Linz to Haley, and I will come to that in the next slides too. You put the patient prone, you make rotations of the hip, you look at the gait pattern, and you look at the foot position. In this patient, it will come to this. So when I put her on the, ben on the bench prone, she can enormously rotate but she cannot rotate backwards. She cannot cross the midline. And by that, you find that she has no external rotation in the hip joint. So extreme internal rotation, no external rotation. And then it's both sides. And when you look at the foot position, great banana socks, by the way, you see a normal position in rotation of both feet. So this young lady has a abnormality in the femur, isolated in the femur. Now this is from the original work, The Fundamentals of Pediatric Orthopedics of Linster Haley, who is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. And this is how to work with that rotational profile. And this only takes like 15 to 20 seconds of your examination of a patient with anterior knee pain. Look at how they walk. Put them prone, rotate the hips, as I've shown you, and look at these diagrams. There is a spread of normal. But if you go very asymmetric, one-sided or both-sided from normal, and you cannot cross the midline, like is shown here, then a rotation, rotational abnormality may be present. And finally, you look at the status, the foot position. And there's also a spread in Western population, Caucasian population, normally the feet point 20 degrees outward. And there's a spread to maximum 35 degrees, that's two standard deviations. But above that, then we have abnormality. This is my daughter. She had a rotational deformity at two and a half years old. You could sit like four hours, she had this rotation profile and she couldn't move beyond zero. And this was the foot position. Now this is 12 year old. She can, it's hard, but she can still find the position. Now she can sit like this. This is not very elegant for a lady, but she can do that. She couldn't do that at all. And this is rotation prone, one direction. And I've just followed her up. I didn't do any surgery because I know that more than 90 degrees of coxae ante torta, which she had, have a spontaneous correction before the age of nine year old in female 
and 10 to 12 years old in male. So spontaneous correction. And that's what we see. This is the normal values in rotational growth. Femur antiversion, when you start, 40 degrees antiversion, it goes back to 20 and ends 10 to 20 degrees. And we all know these values. Tibia version at birth, all these young, these toddlers have internal rotation of the foot. When they first start walking, they stumble because their feet are inwardly rotated. Rapidly then, the feet grow outward. 10 years of age, already 20 degrees. Adult age, Western population, 20 to 25 degrees is normal. Out of that, I published somewhere in the early 2000s a study on the normal values and the indications for derotation osteotomies. Derotation osteotomies is while uh, rotating the uh, bone backwards, femur as well as tibia. And then we make these CT scan measurements where we look at the proximal femur, distal femur, proximal tibia, and distal tibia. And from that, we have standard deviations and then indications where we want to do rotational osteotomies. Now, how do we do these rotational osteotomies? These are just some quick slides, intraoperative slides. You can rotate the femur at the proximal part by a rotation subtrochanteric area or intertrochanteric area. And then you use often these blade plates for fixation. And with these triangles, you can just refer to the measurements you have made on CT scans. And then you can cut the bone and rotate until these K wires in the bones are uh, parallel. And then you have corrected according to your planning. More uh, often we do distal femoral rotation. So in the same bone, you can also rotate more distally. Better bone healing, easier surgery. And this is to show you step by step what we do. This kind of incisions on the lateral distal femur we put a K wire in for reference. This is opening up. We put K wires here in one line and we'll rotate them offset later on. This is after the rotation. This is the plate fixation. And this is the fixation of the plate in the bone. So this is a distal femoral rotation osteotomy performed to correct a femoral rotation deformity. And in the end, it leaves a scar in the skin like that. Now, this is a torsional malalignment or miserable, mal miserable malalignment patient. She has a femoral deformity, but she also has a tibial rotation deformity. This is far more than normal. So she was corrected both femur and tibia. Now, let's have a look at this young lady. She has this, you've seen this video already, she has this very unstable gait. What is causing her kneeing in? What is causing that? She has a straight leg, we've seen that. When you investigate her, you put her, according to the rotational profile, again, prone. Femur is normal. She has normal femoral rotations and she has this very abnormal, this is the left leg, abnormal foot position. So she has a tibial rotational deformity. How do we treat that? This is the osteotomy, a proximal tibia osteotomy, rotation here, plate fixation on the lateral side, staple fixation on the medial side. This is three months after surgery, follow-up, full bone healing. This is her walking three months after the surgery. She has a stable walking pattern. She has no kneeing in anymore. She is off crutches. And this is a surgery that only takes like 40 minutes. So please, if you have patients like this and you, as you see that now explained, send them in. Because it's for us, it's, if we recognize this, it's so easy to help them. And it's a life changer. This lady, from 12 years old, 
until her whole puberty, until 17 year old, was partly on crutches, a long time on crutches, with a very unstable knee. And it's so easy to treat. Rotational osteotomies of the proximal tibia, you can go above the tuberosity or below the tuberosity. And with that, you can also rotate the tuberosity to get some more stable patella tracking. We can make measurements and plan whether we want to heal, then we perform step by step this the kind of surgery for that we put in the K wire and then the K wires are off and we rotate the foot until it's in the right position. And this is the lowest level of the tibia, larger deformities of the tibia, we can rotate uh, just above the ankle joint, and we can also um, uh, make a rotational osteotomy of the distal tibia in large deformities with small incisions and plate fixation, and this is the end result. Now, what are the results? Just some short uh, uh, quotations of studies. Derotational HTO for patellofemoral instability and pain. Almost 90% 90, 90 good to excellent result uh, by server in 96. Proximal tibial rotation also showed me an own series. All these patients had improvements. Mean nine years follow up. 17 of 18 patients would have the surgery again. Anterior knee pain with excess femoral antiversion. These are the scores. 95% of patients would have the surgery again. So this looks like big surgery, but it's very effective. The bone causes the deformity and the anterior knee pain. Femoral antitorsion and retortorsion and miserable malalignment. Decrease of knee pain, normal gait pattern after combined distal femoral and high tibial osteotomies. In the literature, it's difficult to find, but there are publications on this specific topic. For you to take home, please check for rotational deformities in these patients with patellofemoral pathology, whether it's pain or instability. Every so many patient has this. And if you do not, you can send them for physiotherapy, but physiotherapists listening know of these patients. They will have again and again patellofemoral complaints and you, in the end, you cannot win from the bone. The bone always wins. A simple rotational profile explanation will put you on the right track. You've seen how it works. Treatment results of anterior knee pain patients with rotational deformities are good. They're just good. So please refer these patients. This is my address. You're most welcome to refer them, and we're happy to treat them at the London Knee Osteotomy Center. Thank you for your attention. Well, that's a, thank you so much. A fascinating talk, as always. Um, I've, I've, I've known you for a while now and I still always learn something every time I um, listen to that talk and particularly with assessing the patients. I know that's the hardest thing that all of us uh, find to do and making sure that we're treating them in the, in the correct way. I'm just going to get, if Christian could load up his talk, we've got one quick question, Ronald, if you don't mind. Um, no problem. One of the questions was, uh, what is the cutoff um, uh, 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 value for rotational osteotomies and getting neurovascular injuries. I think the question is essentially, do you notice any changes in the neurovasculature the more you rotate and is there a limit to where you go? Well, there are limits, of course. Um, limits for, for example, isolated tibial rotation without stretching the perineal nerve. Um, and there are always stretch injuries, not so much cutting injuries. You can protect these nerves. We do not rotate more than like 20 degrees in the proximal tibia. In post-traumatic cases where there is scar tissue around the nerve, you may have a problem um, and you have to release this kind of uh, scar tissue before you do large rotations. But um, normally you can do large rotations even up to 30 degrees in the femur and or the tibia when you choose the right level. So these, these uh, surgeries, you have to prepare well and you have to be aware that there are limits to stretching of nerves. But if you release these nerves, normally 
you can uh, you can uh, prevent any damage of them. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, thank you. So, Ronald, we've got lots of questions, actually, and I, but I think I will go to uh, Christian and take a few of the questions at the end, if that's OK with everybody. Can I, um, can I just make a, can I, can I just make a quick comment, yeah, um, Rags? Yeah. Uh, when, I mean, this, this surgery is very routine for us now. We've, we've actually identified a number of, of, of patients, um, and they're quite easy to pick when you, when you understand the clinical examination. We get the rotational CT. We've got a great group of radiologists that work with us, and with our own planning, we can, we can see who needs, who needs the surgery. We've seen some fantastic results. Um, we were visited by, we have, travel, we have a visiting fellowship in London, uh, which is very popular. So if there are any orthopedic surgeons, uh, physios, podiatrists, uh, GPs that want to come and see uh, Ronald in action, we had Daniel Awabi, is a very well-known uh, uh, lower limb mm -hmm. surgeon from the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York visitors recently. And he was standing in theatre watching the magic of Ronald as he was doing a double level derotational osteotomy, femur tibia and a tibial tubercle realignment procedure, making it all effortless, an hour and 25 minutes, hour and 30 minutes of surgery. And he said to the other visitors, we've got a number that day, this is extremely complicated surgery and he's making it look very, very easy. So it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to work with you, Ronald, and to see these cases and to learn myself. It's been an amazing experience with both you and Christy in the last 12 months. And for my own learning, I've learned so much by seeing you assess the patients, watching you do the surgical planning, uh, and seeing you in action in the operating theatre. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Cheers, Adrian. Um, that, that's, uh, you know, and I echo all of those sentiments. It's, it's always going back to being a registrar when we're in theatre with, with Ronald, we're there to learn. Um, so next, I'd like to introduce Christian, Christian Clay. Uh, Christian Clay is a good friend and colleague of ours, and Adrian introduced him earlier. He's, he's such a um, skillful surgeon, Adrian let him operate on his hip. So, um, so Christian is, um, works in Hanover. Um, he's both a hip and knee surgeon. He does uh, day case um, hip, hip replacements, day case uh, osteotomies. And um, he's really uh, rev he's revolutionized the way we do osteotomy surgery with minimal access surgery. Uh, traditionally, a lot of these osteotomy patients will uh, used to stay in many days after the operation, but it's not unusual for them to go home the same day or the following morning now. So, um, so it's uh, with great pleasure that I'd like to introduce uh, Christian, uh, who's going to talk to us today about uh, joint preservation techniques. Uh, thanks, Christian. So thanks for the um, introduction. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, first at hand, uh, thanks for the warm words. Adrian and uh, Rekvia are selling themselves quite short here. Uh, I think that everyone knows uh, what a tremendous team they've built up and um, uh, what kind of work is produced there uh, in, uh, in, in the group of orthopedic specialists. And I guess that everyone knows that uh, Ronald is, uh, is a monster of osteotomy and it's really always a pleasure. Uh, to listen to these uh, um, uh, torsional deformity talks because, uh, well, every time you learn something new and regarding the hip of Adrian, I guess he wasn't very much aware. He, he went, must have went through difficult times and wasn't pretty, pretty aware of what he was doing, but anyhow. Um, so hopefully uh, I can now share my screen and share... Um, share my slides with you. And I was asked uh, to give a lecture on uh, osteotomies. So, and as osteotomies um, in UK are considered to be uh, some kind of tricky thing, I called my uh, lecture Osteo What? Um, and it's in the change of times. So, uh, and obviously this is a, a conglomerate of, uh, of uh, well, what we've all brought together here. So it's not just uh, exclusively my lecture, but I will give you some outside on osteotomy and uh, what we understand it is. So um, let me start uh, with a little bit of history first at hand. Uh, and uh, well, this is younger history, but uh, that sums up all the older history because Adrian published himself um, a, a very remarkable uh, paper that uh, basically describes um, uh, osteotomy in the change of times. Uh, and um, looks at it from an historical, modern early years and modern latter years perspective, and nowadays osteotomy as we perform them. Well, osteotomy is around for quite some time, and obviously there is a historical part of uh, osteotomy, 
which is um, rather uh, scary, I guess. So no one would consider that to be a very uh, sophisticated treatment uh, that he wants to undergo. So let's get rid of that and let's go to the later times, which is not the latter times, but the later historical times. But here we are entering a stage where uh, people like Sir uh, William McEwen from Glasgow and others like Nikulic um, really uh, were uh, producing something which was extraordinary, I would say, for those days and those times. Um, um, William McEwen himself uh, wrote a remarkable book uh, where he followed 1,800 cases that he operated himself with a seven-year follow-up showing all these results, giving outlines on distal femoral and proximal tibial osteotomy, closing wedge, open wedge, and so on and so on. So um, we were quite far back then, and we really have to thank our forefathers for these, uh, uh, for these um, uh, pioneering work uh, they, they cr produce on osteotomy. But anyhow, when we enter the uh, later modern or uh, modern early years, uh, which was then from 40 till 2000, then we have to say that most of the treatments we have seen were lateral closing wedges, uh, HTO, without looking very individualized at femoral or tibial malalignment whatsoever. It was rather like if there is a varus treated at the tibia, if there is a valgus treated at the femur. And um, well, it was, it was, generally speaking, uh, quite, um, quite bad results that were uh, created. So poor general um, outcome, uh, wide range of indications. So it was not very clear for what to use osteotomy really. Um, the complication rate was obviously quite high for these lateral closing wedge osteotomies. You may have a risk for the perineal nerve. And uh, well, uh, keeping the correction where you wanted it was also difficult. So there was quite a high um, degree of loss of correction and maybe, well, no idea of where to put the correction anyhow. So the question then is, um, why did osteotomy die in the 70s? Well, I, I don't think that's really a question because it had to die. Um, as arthroplasty came along and osteotomy was not creating, uh, creating results that were really favorable. So one thought then, well, here we have it, we can replace everything and put some metal and plastic inside and, and here we found the holy grail. So, and it all started uh, with unis and then bilateral unis, so segmented uh, um, uh, arthroplasty of the knee, but then total knees came along and well, since we have the all natural knee, well, there is rather an industry that came up. And uh, if we look um, at registry data, uh, such as this one from Sweden, you can see that over the years, HTO uh, with dropping figures, unicondylar replacements, well, somewhere down there um, at, at, at even figures, but anyhow, not really big. And uh, total knee arthroplasty was really growing and Rex already reported that in the UK, you have approximately 100,000 um, implantations per year. In Germany, we double those figures to 200,000. And uh, if we look um, uh, to the United States, well, I don't know the figures there, but it must be insane. So all overall, this is an industrialization of total knee arthroplasty. So this is what industry promises when you undergo um, um, total knee arthroplasty. And I've copied those ones out of the internet. And uh, well, obviously you're, you're uh, taught that you should not wait too long to get your knee replaced and so on and so on. And you always look at smiling faces, uh, really uh, streamlined, uh, very shiny, and, and all these people are happy and lucky and of course rich and successful. And at the end, what we have to see is that obviously what industry tells us is, well, just partially right, let's say. Of course, there is a big cohort for people that do great with a total knee arthroplasty. If you're an elderly patient having a completely rotten knee, well, that needs replacement. And that's great. And Obviously, uh, that can be a, a, the perfect surgery for you. But if you look really closely, and we've done that over the last couple of years, at the statistics, then you see that the revision rate for total knee arthroplasty, especially under the age of, I would say 60, this goes now to 55, um, is really completely unacceptable. 
So, and this is old data. Now let's look at what was published in England uh, in 2015. And if you look at patients being, well, let's say up till 60 or even under 55 years of age, then you see a completely unacceptable revision rate. Um, look at this, uh, that, was, uh, that was published um, by Bayliss in, in Lancet. So uh, that's really not a journal which is known for poor statistics. So, and uh, well, it shows the um, effect of patient age and, and uh, intervention on uh, risk of implant revision. So this is about 500, no, 53,000 patients uh, undergoing total knee arthroplasty. So these are figures that you really uh, cannot, con cannot really um, um, cannot deny. And it's, it's 20 years follow up and it's all very uh, well documented, propensitory matched, highest degree of statistics. So looking at that, we see that male patients have a 35%, so more than one third revision rate in the first five years, and that does mean change of implant. So that's completely unacceptable. So treating male patients uh, under 55 should be forbidden, and uh, except that there is post-traumatic or other reasons, but just for initial osteoarthritis, obviously that's completely insane. So David Murray from, that was looking at revision rate, but um, there is a different approach. And I thought that was kind of a funny thing because David Murray was kind of, um, yeah, upset with the fact from the, uh, David from the, from the Oxford group was kind of upset with the fact that when looking at, um, at registry data uh, and we are just looking at an endpoint criteria of revision, then of course this is kind of unfair if you look at unis and compare it to total needs because this this is absolutely biased by ourselves as surgeons well if you take the same patient with the same pain level coming after undergoing unicondylar replacement well uh, you would say I, ha I have an alternative and i could convert that uh, into a total well if that patient already has a total having the same pain uh, pain level you would probably say well you're uh, at the end of the road and i cannot do any further treatments for you so this is biased and therefore not worth looking at it really and uh, so he thought i i just choose another endpoint criteria of my examination which is death and looking at death rates uh, we have to see that if you treat patients with the uni, obviously, due to the um, complication rate and the morbidity, um, you see that the major uh, impacts, such as thrombosis, embolism, infection, apoplex, or uh, cardiac infarction, well, these are statistically, uh, statistically proven higher uh, if you undergo total knee replacement than unicondylar replacement. And for those reasons, if you sum that up, and if you, if you treat 100 patients every year, uh, or I don't know, if you treat 100 patients over a, um, a time frame of eight years in your, in your uh, clinic uh, who receive a total knee replacement uh, that could have uh, um, been treated with a uni or potentially uh, with a HTO, you at least kill one patient and uh, that patient will die unnecessarily. So obviously, uh, well, if you really, need to make that as uh, your guideline for treatment. That's another question, but it's a funny aspect of looking at it. And obviously total knee arthroplasty isn't half as safe as we all think. So there must be alternatives, but even those alternatives like unicondylar replacement, which I would consider uh, partially um, uh, preserving surgery. Well, these figures drop. And uh, the revision rates as the patients um, get younger, as we don't have good alternatives, especially in this younger age group, well, the revision rates in these younger patients, obviously they rise. And uh, well, we don't want to have that. Uh, and, and looking now at the alternatives in this term here, unicondylar replacement, well, what, what kind of patients are treated well uh, with partial knee replacements? Well, it has to be an end-stage osteoarthritis. This is the recommendation. So we need a bone-on-bone -bone disease, calgren lawrence 4. Well, the results of patients coming with calgren lawrence 2 or 3 are completely unpredictable. So now let's take a look at the patients that enter our clinics. And there is a nice study from, uh, from Nuffield Surgical Center and uh, the idea was to take a look at the patients and what kind of patients there are really coming in 
um, uh, and and uh, seeking for treatment. Well, and it has been shown that uh, almost 40% of the patients that uh, come into your clinics have Calgren and Lawrence 2, and almost 40 once again uh, have Calgren and Lawrence 3. So there is just a quarter of these patients that are potentially applicable for replacement surgery. So just one quarter with a full thickness defect. And out of this quarter, potentially 50% could go for unicondylar replacement and the other ones would go for total knee replacement. That would mean like 12 and a half for each pathway of treatment. So um, in fact, there is something for these patients if they have a deformity. So the only question now is, do these patients have a constitutional deformity, a varus or valgus, or is this deformity rather intra-articular due to wear? Those patients, if they have a full thickness defect, might be applicable for a uni. All the others having a constitutional deformity would be patients in their so-called treatment gap. And this treatment gap is the Calgren and Lawrence grade zero till three with a constitutional deformity, potentially meniscus tear at the medial or lateral side, and so on and so on. So there is plenty of those patients. And there is this remarkable slide from Roman Zeil, and that shows uh, that you have some, um, some um, well, some treatment options in the repair zone, which is the green box. Then you have the reconstruction zone, which is uh, the orange box. And then you have these salvage procedures in the red box. And obviously we want to keep all our patients in the green repair zone, because once you enter the other ones, it's a never come back scenario. So you cannot undo that and go back into the other boxes that you've left. So osteotomies, are the last workhorse of the, of the um, repair box and therefore considered to be completely regenerative surgery. So why should we fix these malalignments? Well, obviously there might be other uh, things and we were talking about menisci and ligaments and cartilage problems, but the alignment is really key. So if you don't fix the malalignment, all the other treatments are potentially doomed to fail. Because if you have a valgus, then you have a lateral hyperpressure. And if you have a varus, you have a medial hyperpressure. And that's really proven. And if we look at epidemiologic data, uh, then a frontal plane deformity of more than three degrees increases the risk of osteoarthritis. And once the osteoarthritis is there and you don't treat the malalignment, the progression of osteoarthritis will be 10 to 20 times faster. So is that now common that patients have malalignments? Well, it is. Uh, if you look at uh, take a look at this study uh, from from Bellamans, well, he has offered um, not patients, uh, just normal pedestrians coming down the road, uh, wanting to visit a cinema, 100 euros for undergoing a long leg X-ray. So he just asked random people on the street whether they would be available for this uh, study, and uh, he paid them 100 quid. So maybe. Uh, that's a little bias inside there. Maybe poor people uh, may have more varus or valgus malalignments. I don't know. But anyhow, he found out, uh, assuming that this is a normal spread uh, throughout the population, that one third of the male patients have a, a constitutional varus deformity and 70%, at least 17% of the females. And who would have thought that? So um, looking at that, well, we know now that we know now that we have a certain proportion of patients that we could treat potentially uh, with an osteotomy, and especially the ones, as I told you, with a constitutional varus, and that's really the only um, qualifier we have. So the question is not how old is the patient, is he a smoker, how obese is the patient, and so on and so on. Well, there is plenty of prejudices that go around. And I would say it's rather myths that, uh, that um, uh, qualify uh, today for, at least in some indicational uh, charts, whether a patient undergoes osteotomy or no. The only question is, is there a constitutional varus or not? If there is, the result is excellent. And if there is not, the result is not good. So 
let's come uh, to uh, the modern letter years because that's interesting. Somewhat sometime people remembered that there was a different treatment apart from putting uh, metal and plastic inside because, um, uh, well, people discovered that it's somewhat not quite the ho holy grail we've really discovered. And so um, it was really Giancarlo Pudu who, uh, who designed this Pudu plate and thought, well, a little uh, open wedge osteotomy, which was um, basically advocated anyhow uh, a little earlier in France already. Um, but he designed this plate uh, to, get, uh, to get the problems of uh, maintaining this uh, correction, uh, um, to get, uh, get rid of those problems. So he designed this plate and that was quite a success for the open wedge osteotomy of the proximal tibia and became the workhorse then. But anyhow, uh, this plate had, uh, well, downsides, let's say. So as it was one of the first generations and just the initial idea of getting back to osteotomy, the plate itself wasn't that stable and we had, have seen quite some uh, fractures of the hinge. So in fact, Professor Staubli from Switzerland came with the idea of, um, of creating another plate, which was called the Tomofix, which was really the breakthrough and is up till now uh, the standard uh, for, um, well, uh, stability testings. And here we come back to Ronald van Herwarden because Ronald was then pioneering on this Tomofix uh, family along with uh, Professor Lobenhofer from Hanover. And uh, they all uh, really made tremendous work um, and, and have proven that uh, this uh, concept of angle stable plate fixating uh, osteotomies that, that really works. So, just because of that, we came to a renaissance, a true renaissance of uh, osteotomy. Um, and this renaissance of osteotomy led uh, all these nice uh, renaissance places you see here, led uh, to, uh, uh, to a scenario where we felt really we are able to treat melaline things and put them uh, into some straight uh, formation just to be able uh, to get rid of uh, hypertension and overload. So I could now tell you possibly ages something about uh, what has happened in terms of technical um, approaches. I just want to show you what we do today um, in, in, um, in the London um, Osteotomy Center. So uh, we designed approaches that are rather tiny today. Well, not for each and every indication. Ronald has shown you that obviously um, uh, rotational correction needs some uh, bigger approach. But anyhow, we can now treat really uh, frontal plane deformities with rather minimally invasive incisions and bring in the plates um, uh, through tiny keyholes. Well, this is just like three centimeters. You need to just make sure that you go to the very back of the femur and protect the neurovascular structure. So we also designed and uh, pioneered on uh, protection devices for that. So, and then it's really a very, very standardized treatment. So what, what has been really a very difficult surgery today uh, in, um, with these, uh, uh, with these uh, techniques that were designed over the last couple of years is rather a very, very standardized and straightforward surgery um, that you can really, um, get easily done in half an hour or maybe 40 minutes uh, as we speak about the femur. And uh, if we go further, one step further here, um, well, this is uh, such, a, um, such a protection device that we designed due to the problems with the neuro uh, neurovascular bundle in the back, which was always a problem uh, for the tibial um, osteotomy. And if we now go for this tibial osteotomy, you see that the incision is somewhat the same. So it's not really that traumatic anymore. And uh, in contrast, what we did before, we now don't really approach the tibia from the front of the medial collateral ligament, as you can see here, but from the back, that's the same ligament, the superficial layer that Adrian has shown you before um, um, in, in this, uh, acute uh, rupture case. So now we protect the posterior part of the tibia and perform this cut under safe uh, means uh, so that we uh, can 
have a very safe approach to the to the posterior structures. So um, this is uh, a tool that we designed. So you see, we work with the industry here to develop um, to develop instruments. This is just one example. So uh, modern uh, technologies gave us the opportunity to uh, really develop something uh, which is which is completely novel, and uh, and we can uh, design that, take it to the industry, and bring this as an advantage to our patients and improve our treatments uh, um, further and further. So treatment of knee osteoarthritis. Uh, um, now, if you look at the, uh, at the statistics from my own practice in Hanover, looking back at 2015 in the group where I worked in, we treated one third uh, of each patient, of, of, of the cohort of osteoarthritis uh, patients that came with uh, osteoarthritic knees. Um, so, it was one third for osteotomy, one third for unicondylar replacement, and one third for total knee replacement. I guess that's fair figures um, if you look at the statistics I've shown you before. Um, and two out of three patients, and I guess that's the, the key message here, don't really need a total knee arthroplasty. And this is especially true if you talk about the younger age group. So now my take home messages from that lecture um, TKA should be for patients above 60 years of age. If possible, try to avoid them. Think of the alignment more often. When you look at patients having problems, uh, uh, unilateral um, uh, problems with their knees, think of the alignment more often. And of course, think of us, of orthopedic specialists, because we care about the treatment gap. So we have seen that before. I don't have to stress. Okay, I don't want to stress that any further. I'm just open for questions now, because I guess there must be some, and of course, uh, plenty of other questions for uh, the other lecturers that we've heard before. Uh, me myself, I have one for Ronald, for example, but I didn't want to ask early on. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Christian. That was a fantastic overview. Um, and uh, thanks for taking us on that journey. I mean, it's been a, amazing to see the transformation in the UK when we first started out with osteotomy, really due to Ronald's um, uh, showing, Neil Thomas from, uh, from Basingstoke, exactly what was going on in Europe when they made the trip together to the States. Ronald was then the young ESCA traveling fellow, and Neil Thomas, the ex-president of the British Knee Society and ESCA, was just blown away by what was going on in Germany and what was going on in the Netherlands and continental Europe. And back in 2004, 2005, osteotomy just did not feature in the United Kingdom. So it's amazing uh, what you and what Ronald and, and the osteotomy uh, experts from Europe have brought into our country. And we're very grateful for that. I've got a, I've got a, a question for you, Christian. Uh, I, I know the answer myself, but it would be good to hear from you and from Ronald and from RAGS, how, how much uh, as a percentage of our patients that we treat have bone on bone grade four osteoarthritis? How common is it to treat that end stage bone on bone x-ray that we see and how effective is osteotomy in the right uh, patient with metaphyseal varus? So I'll ask, I'll ask that to you first, Christian, and perhaps Ronald can also make a comment on RAGS. Yeah, um, thanks, Adrian. So that's, that's a, a good question, actually, uh, it's, it's often considered that osteotomy is reserved for patients having, uh, having not full thickness defects. But in fact, uh, we have a multicentric study where Ronald contributed, and uh, that shows precisely um, that uh, even full thickness defect patients uh, benefit from osteotomies uh, tremendously. So um, it's just a question whether they've had um, constitutional deformity before entering that uh, full thickness defect. So if there is a constitutional deformity and you can prove that and there are concepts for that like a tibial bone varus angle examination and so on and so on, we don't uh, go into um, details here because I guess that would need a course and, and quite some more lectures, but yes, Full thickness defects are absolutely uh, doable with osteotomies. The outcome is excellent if the patients have malalignments um, that are suitable for that. Um, but obviously we see that the treatment pathways are completely contrary to that. 
So usually so, when, when patients have full thickness defects, they are not treated with osteotomies and one tends to enter the definitive treatment pathway of getting out of that green box that I've shown you uh, before, going directly into that orange box, which is a pity for some of those patients. Or, or they're offered absolutely nothing because they're too young and they're, it's felt that they should wait. Right, wait then we are once again into, into this, sorry for, intro, uh, for, for interrupting you, but then we are once again into this uh, funny term of, uh, of treatment gap. So uh, I have to tell you that story. I, I wasn't aware that there was something like a treatment gap because the treatment gap in our terminology doesn't exist. So I, I've heard that first when I came to the UK. So, and I really was wondering why, why is there a treatment gap? And the, the answer is quite simple because there was no tool such as osteotomy. Mm. Ronald, what about your experience? Because many of our patients do present late. They present with grade four bone on bone on the x-ray or indeed on MRI or uh, on arthroscopic view. But these end stage bone on bone cases, what's your experience? Is it common and how effective is it? I think you're muted, uh, Ronald, just uh, unmute yourself, sorry. Here I am, here I am. Yeah, perfect, uh, perfect. Again. Sorry about it. Well, um, I think many of the listeners know of these patients, house doctors as well as physiotherapists know these patients who come back again and again, who stay in the conservative treatment zone, which may be helpful for a couple of years, but in these years, if they have a malalignment, if they have this constitutional varus or valgus, the progression of the osteoarthritis continues. So it may be wise in that time frame, in that period of time, to send them in just for a full extending x-ray, is example of which you have seen in the presentations, just to make sure what is the alignment and is there a progression of osteoarthritis to prevent them from progressing into the grade four. To answer your question on how many patients I treat with grade four, well, I have a referral practice in any of the countries I do, uh, do practice. There are, there's a certain percentage that has grade four. And as I've treated quite a lot of osteotomy patients, also grade four in young patients, I know that only straightening the leg by itself creates a situation where you stop the progression of the osteoarthritis, whether it's grade four or not. Only that. And then you can win years. And I've been privileged to work with and be a resident during my, my residency years of Professor Rene Marty. And we edited a book together where there is like 20 to 30 years follow up after osteotomies. In his time, these were, they started in the 50s and 60s. TKR replacements were not used many, many of them in Europe yet, and also probably not in the UK. So they didn't have anything else than osteotomies at that time. And with perfect skills, they made a lot of patients happy with osteotomies, even grade four as a salvage procedure. When you see 30 years follow up after these osteotomies, patients still doing well, not asking for a replacement, you start to believe in the effect of osteotomies. So I'm fully biased, I consider that, but I have seen treatments, long-term effects, even in grade four patients who were of younger age, by, because of that, didn't get a replacement, but got an osteotomy. And these patients were still good after many, many years. So consider referral of these patients. And we're not gonna treat each and every stage four, no way. But we can make a proper selection based on experience. And we have a lot of experience combined, I think, in this London Knee Osteotomy Group. Right, do you have anything to add? I mean, a lot of it's been covered, but yeah. I mean, one thing to say is from our experience, um, what would you say is the doctor's choice? You've seen many uh, knee surgeons come to Ronald and, 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 and Christian We've had a few now. What, what's what, what, what? You know, why do you think that's the case? Yeah, I mean that's a that's a good question, Adrian. We we know that from conferences that we've attended that we've asked whole 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 groups of surgeons as to you know if they had osteoarthritis affecting the medial or lateral compartment of the knee, what would they have 
you know the vast the most nearly everybody would say an osteotomy hands down and we know that because arthroplasty just doesn't give the same results you can't have a better joint than the one that nature gave you and certainly in this country just adding on what christian was saying you know in europe both ronald and christian have had great experience with osteotomy certainly in the uk it's been a cultural um uh, culture towards arthroplasty even in the younger younger age group and we know the outcomes from arthroplasty particularly in the under 60s as christian nicely demonstrates in his talk is is not is not very good and it just doesn't last uh, the length of time the time that it takes for them to get a revision and the outcomes are just not 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 there so even in my early practice um uh, in in london it's been it's been real diff it's been difficult having a change in culture as to how we manage young patients even with grade four disease often they're just left um with not much treatment at all yeah uh, well look i think we've, we've nearly gone to two hours so probably it's a good time to um, to halt at this point, but uh, I'm going to uh, uh, just um, sum up by saying thank you to Ali for, for for stepping in and moderating and helping with the intros, and also for getting us all together. Really, I'd like to thank Nima in the background. I know he's listening for also pushing to set up the group. I'd like to thank my friends for making the time to come to London uh, and for joining with us. I'd like to thank uh, everyone for attending this evening for for attending this brilliant webinar. Rags, I'll, I'll let you just uh, say some closing remarks. Great. Yeah. So. Um, so thanks, Adrian, and you know, just to echo those. Uh, thank you for everyone for coming. And this is the first um, orthopedic specialist uh, webinar that we're we're doing as part of our commitment to CPD and um, making sure that we are educate, um, educating and um, getting people involved with these sorts of seminars. So our next event is going to be with um, Ali, Mr. Ali Nurani, um, uh, together with Professor Roger Van Reet. And they're going to cover all things related to upper limb uh, surgery. So um, uh, Ali's going to talk about uh, shoulder instability. Um, he's a well-known and respected surgeon, uh, both um, nationally and internationally for his work around there. And, and Professor Van Reet um, frequently visits the UK, lectures around the world on the circuit around elbow surgery and uh, his um, management of elbow stiffness and conditions around the elbow. So that's on the 3rd of June. That's for a note for your diary. And then, and then um, the next the one after is going to be with uh, Mr. Nima Hadari um, he, uh, and uh, Mr. Tom Hester. Um, both these guys are uh, well-respected foot and ankle surgeons. And they're going to talk uh, around ankle instability and heel pain on the, on the 17th of June. All of these events attract um, CPD points. So um, providing we'll send out a questionnaire to all the uh, people who have attended and you'll get a certificate of attendance with your CPD points um, also. Um, I'm gonna finish there. Um, well, thank you very much um, for coming along to the uh, webinar today. There's um, a lot of questions in the Q&As that I will um, answer um, separately um, and get back to you guys. But if you wish to visit us, um, please get in touch. Uh, we routinely have uh, visitors in our theaters, uh, watching in surgeries, uh, seeing patients with us. Uh, as part of a learning process. Um, if you've got anybody you'd like us to, to see or help you with, uh, these are our details. And we're always uh, putting on um, uh, inform information as to what we offer on our social media. Uh, so thanks again, and um, I think we'll wrap up there. <laughs> right. Great, thanks guys. Great job guys, great job. See you all soon. <laughs> Bye -bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much.